Now let me introduce the speaker. Uh, Ralph De Lorenz received his Bachelor's in Engineering in Aerospace Systems Engineering from the University of Southampton in the UK, and then a PhD in Physics in 1994 from the University of Kent in Canterbury. He worked from 1990 to 91 for the European Space Agency on the design of the Huygens probe, and during the, his PhD research, designed and built its uh, uh, penetrometer instrument that 12 years later measured the mechanical properties of Titan's surface when Huygens landed on, 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 on Titan in January 2005. From 1994 to 2006, uh, Ralph worked as a planetary scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory at the University of Arizona with particular interest in Titan, Mars, planetary climate, non-equilibrium aerodynamics, uh, aerospace vehicles, and radars. Uh, he then joined the uh, Applied Physics Laboratory at uh, Johns Hopkins, where he continues to work on those topics uh, as well. Uh, the, uh, he's also, Ralph has also played a major role in defining, his research has played a major role in defining possible future missions in, uh, to Titan, most notably the Titan Mare Exp Explorer, TIME. Uh, he's a recipient of, NASA's, of five NASA's Group Achievement Awards. He's the author of, or co author of three of several books including Lifting Titan's Veil, Spinning Flight, and Space Systems Failures. And he has also authored, co -authored over 200 uh, ref uh, refereed journal, uh, publication refereed journals. With that, please join me in welcoming Ralph Lorenz to deliver his lecture on Selling the Seas of Titan, Saturn's Earth-like Moon. Dr. Lorenz. Thank you very Thank much. You. <clears throat> Well, good evening. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity this evening to uh, share uh, some of my, what I'd have to call, scientific adventures exploring Titan over the years. Um, it really has been um, an interesting couple of decades um, during which I've um, worked in three different countries and transcended, I've, I've lost count of how many, how many disciplines. Um, uh, what I hope to do is, is uh, as, uh, as we just described, capture some of the, the latest findings and, and maybe the, the prospects uh, for the future. Um, but just um, sort of by way of, of historical review, is this too loud? Oh, okay. Um, when I got started in all this as a, as a graduate student back in um, uh, 1992 or so, um, you could sit down and, and read every paper that had been published about Titan. Um, as, you'll, as you'll learn, it was uh, uh, the object of the Voyager encounters. It's been a, an object of, of great interest um, since the dawn of the space age and compares favorably with uh, other moons of the outer solar system. Um, but um, because it has an atmosphere and it changes with time, there's a lot more to study about it than the, let's call them, naked uh, worlds of the solar system. And of course, um, uh, even though uh, new telescopes are coming online and telling us new things, it's really the arrival of Cassini um, in 2004 um, that has, has caused the uh, literature to, to explode. Um, because Titan touches so many different disciplines. Um, not only the sort of classical planetary geology and planetary atmospheres, um, but there's a very rich organic chemistry that gets chemists excited. There are processes on Titan's surface that are unique to the Earth and Titan. Um, and the, so there's so much more uh, going on that um, uh, it, it's just Im impossible to keep up. Uh, papers are coming out at you know, dozens every month. Um, so this will not do anything more than just skim the surface. Um, for those who haven't uh, had the uh, fortune of looking through a telescope at, at uh, Saturn and Titan, this is how they compare. This is with a 10-inch, 12-inch telescope, 10-inch, uh, and, and a webcam. Um, Titan is about as small a thing as you can see that isn't just a dot. Um, its angular um, width is roughly one arc second. There was a very... Um, uh, talented Catalan astronomer, Coma Sola, in 1907, who could tell with a um, roughly a 14-inch telescope that Titan's disk 
um, didn't have a hard edge like the moon, but was slightly fuzzy, was dark at the edges, so-called limb darkening. And Como Sola correctly interpreted that to mean that Titan had an atmosphere. Uh, he, he also knew that um, Mars didn't have canals. Um, his eyesight was very good. Whether that's a reproducible uh, scientific observation uh, or, um, or it's just a lucky guess, uh, sort of depends on your historical perspective, but certainly with modern instrumentation, you can tell that, that Titan has uh, a fuzzy disk. Um, and so that makes it unique in the solar system in uh, being a planetary satellite, a moon, um, with an atmosphere. Um, that finding was, was uh, made concrete in a reproducible way sp uh, by spectroscopy. Um, the Dutch astronomer Gerard Kuiper um, in Chicago in 44 passed the light from Titan through a prism and stretched it into a spectrum, and the spectrum has these bites taken out of it. And you can do that same experiment with an 8-inch telescope and a, a CCD camera that costs a couple of hundred dollars and a diffraction grating. And uh, there's the image of Saturn, there's the image of Titan. This is one I, I did myself um, when I lived in Tucson. And the light from Saturn's rings is spread out, the light from Saturn is spread out, and Saturn has methane in its atmosphere, and that causes this bite. And if you look very closely at the Titan spectrum, it has these bites taken out of it. These are the same bites that Kuiper discovered the atmosphere with in 1944. So these make Titan special. In fact, this, um, this spectrum changes from year to year, um, and uh, amateur observers uh, can, can actually follow that um, over time. So um, because Titan has an atmosphere, um, that made it especially interesting, and an atmosphere with methane, uh, methane has the property that it is broken down by solar ultraviolet light. And the fragments of molecules that are released combine in all kinds of different ways to produce a whole host of different uh, organic compounds. Um, this, is, uh, this big spike is acetylene, there's uh, propene, um, hydrogen cyanide, ethane, uh, ethylene, which was um, uh, it, uh, its counterpart. Propylene was just, uh, just discovered, or just the discovery was just announced a few, few days ago. Um, cyanogen. Um, there were roughly 20 different compounds discovered by Voyager, and there, there are now hundreds. Um, Voyager was unable to see um, Titan's surface because Voyager's cameras only worked out to the sort of red uh, visible wavelengths. And uh, all this organic muck that's produced by the action of ultraviolet light on, on methane um, makes the atmosphere rather hazy and, and opaque. As you go into the near-infrared with modern cameras and Hubble, um, you can actually see the surface. And if, if you know what to look for, you can actually pull out uh, a few surface features in the Voyager data, but they wouldn't have been believed at the time. Now, the methane that's in the atmosphere um, would be destroyed in something of the order of 10 million years, and the solar system is 4.5 billion years old. So are we looking at um, just a, a rather special half percent of the age of the solar system when Titan happens to have methane, or is the methane resupplied somehow? Is it, is it buffered by volcanism or something from the interior, or is there a reservoir on the surface that is buffering um, the atmosphere against depletion? And it so happens, and this was one of the key results from Voyager, um, it so happens that the surface temperatures of Titan are near the temperatures at which methane can be a liquid, a solid, um, and a gas, near the triple point, much as Earth's temperatures are close to the triple point of water. So this idea that um, there might be methane seas on Titan took hold at this point. And also the notion that ethane, uh, which is uh, also a liquid at these surface temperatures, um, would accumulate over time because the methane is destroyed. A lot of that turns into ethane. And so you have a sort of cycle wherein you might enrich the ocean in ethane over time. The cycle is irreversible because when you break two CH4s apart, methane, uh, to make one C2H6, you have one H2 left over. And the hydrogen molecule, molecular hydrogen, is a very light molecule and it, it can escape to space. So that, that breaks the cycle and you end up accumulating this heavier material, um, ethane, on the surface. That was the, the Voyager view. We um, even thought that perhaps there would be a, a global ocean of this stuff underneath the haze. Um, but um, this photochemistry that clearly is, is interesting and is uh, in, uh, in many ways the precursors to um, more sophisticated synthesis on the surface, um, that's a great 
uh, prebiotic interest, um, was what motivated the formulation of the Cassini mission I'll talk about uh, very soon. So just to um, sort of recap what, what Voyager discovered, it, it really unveiled the, um, the structure of the atmosphere. So this is uh, temperature versus altitude. And uh, the structure in many ways is very Earth-like. Um, the lowest part of the atmosphere um, gets warmer as you get close to the ground. That's largely due to greenhouse warming. Methane is actually a, a strong greenhouse gas, both on Earth uh, and on Titan. Um, the upper atmosphere is warm um, because uh, it absorbs uh, short wavelength light from the sun. In the case of the Earth, that short wave absorption is due to ozone. Um, on Titan, it's due to the haze. Um, and then in the middle, you've got a, a cold trap, a tropopause. Um, uh, and because Titan is 10 times further from the sun than is the Earth, this is relatively cold, um, 77 Kelvin compared with the, uh, the sort of 250 uh, Kelvin um, cold trap in the Earth, at the top of the Earth's troposphere. Um, so you've got a lot of interesting analogs here. There's the so-called anti-greenhouse effect of sunlight absorption and the greenhouse effect in the lower atmosphere. And the greenhouse effect on both worlds, Titan and Earth, um, is driven by a condensable greenhouse gas. The strongest greenhouse agent on the Earth is water, water vapor. Um, and you can get a lot of interesting climate feedbacks because the amount of water vapor depends on how warm it is. So if you warm the surface, you get more water vapor in the atmosphere, more warming, and you get this sort of runaway that um, uh, happened on Venus. Um, you can have the same kind of feedback on, on Titan with methane because methane is a condensable um, and forms clouds, as uh, I'll, I'll show shortly. Um, the other big difference, apart from the fact that the uh, Titan atmosphere is so much uh, colder, is that it's very stretched. Titan is a fairly small world. I mean, it's bigger than the planet Mercury, um, but it, and it's right bigger than our moon, um, but uh, it is smaller somewhat than Mars. Um, its surface gravity is about the same as the Earth's moon, so one-sixth, one-seventh of the Earth. Um, and that gets kind of interesting when you think about how stuff can move around. If you plot um, gravity against the thickness of an atmosphere. That's roughly a measure of how easy it is to, to blow stuff around. Um, then Titan uh, is much easier than the Earth. The gravity is you know, almost 10 times lower, and the air is about four times denser. Um, it's not as dense as Venus, but Venus has Earth-like gravity. Um, and in fact, just, to, just to, for fun, if you think about um, uh, potential habitats on the moon, you know, pressurized modules sitting on the lunar surface, when the astronauts are pouring out their uh, cornflakes or sprinkling sugar on their, their cornflakes, the dynamics are actually going to be very similar um, because of the same gravity and, and, and pressure um, as the mechanics of granular stuff moving around on the surface of Titan. And in fact, uh, that results in spectacular sand dunes, as I'll, uh, I'll describe. Titan uh, rotates synchronously around Saturn. It always fa has the same face pointed to Saturn, same as our moon does towards the Earth. Uh, Saturn and Titan have uh, an inclination of their equator with respect to the orbit uh, of about 29 degrees, roughly the same as the Earth. So Saturn and Titan have seasons, and these seasons are very, very uh, profound, as you'll, you'll see shortly. Um, so Titan is a wonderful world for comparative planetology. Um, you know, it's got an optically thick atmosphere. It's slowly rotating. The day is uh, 16 Earth days. So the dynamics of the upper atmosphere are a lot like those of uh, Venus. Um, it has a, a hydrological cycle where clouds form, and rain falls down, uh, same as the Earth. Um, the seasonal forcing is rather similar to um, the Earth and Mars, and there's some other Martian similarities I'll, uh, I'll uh, point out shortly. Um, there was a, an argument as to whether Titan is Earth-like or not. Um, what I like to say is um, uh, Earth is the uh, second most um, Mars-like world in the solar system. I think I've got that right. Um, uh, one other metric is um, the uh, world in the solar system upon which an unprotected human being would survive the longest um, is Titan. Uh, you know, on Mars, the air would get sucked out of their lungs. They'd collapse very quickly. Uh, on Titan, you could wander around for a couple of minutes before you um, suffocate. I mean, it's going to be cold, um, but in principle, a human being could function with just an oxygen mask and, and a very thick coat. Um, something to think about. Um, so this is all looks very interesting and was the motivation behind um, various mission proposals in the 1980s that culminated in one that actually originated in, in Europe uh, as Cassini um, and was a, a joint endeavor between uh, the European Space Agency, 
uh, formerly the uh, Italian Space Agency as well, um, and, uh, and NASA. Um, Cassini, um, in artist's impression here, is, was the most massive uh, interplanetary spacecraft launched in the West. Um, it's roughly the size of a bus, uh, five and a half tons at launch. Um, I was at the launch in, in Florida in 97, it's a spectacular affair. Um, it needs a four meter dish to send back its data from Saturn. Um, being so far from the sun, you can't use solar panels, you need the radioisotope um, uh, power. Um, it's festooned with instruments uh, and carries the Huygens probe, uh, which was uh, supplied by the European Space Agency, which is how I got into all this. Um, here's the Huygens probe being assembled. Um, I like to show this picture to just sort of explain or underscore you know, why space is expensive. Um, it's not because this is kind of shiny gold-colored stuff. Um, that's just mylar. Um, but this is one-off engineering. This is stuff you build once and you have to make it work. Um, there's no, you don't have the evolution that is characteristic of mass-produced items where when you see that something you know, doesn't work quite right, you can sort of round off the corners. You have to do this once and you have to make it work. Um, there's an interesting pork barreling sort of process that works uh, in the European Space Agency. I mean, remember, you know, these are countries that were at war a few decades before. Um, and the way it works is basically each member state gets industrial contracts in proportion to the budget it receives from um, the, each country. Um, so if you're a project manager and you just want the thing to work, just have the Germans build the whole thing. But what you have to do, what you have to do is make sure that France gets between 20 and 25% of the work and Germany gets 20 and find 5% five, five of stuff for the Dan Danish to do. Um, and so it's like one of these jokes, you know, hell is where the, uh, you know, the cooks are, are German and the police are Italian and all that. You, you, you sometimes have to piece this all together. So you've got all these countries contributing different bits. Um, there's a British parachute, uh, an Italian radio, in spite of which we've got, got some data back. Um, and these bits all have to come together. You have to have the bolts line up with the holes. You have to have the electrical connectors line up. The software has to talk to each other. Um, somebody had to figure out that to attach this Spanish structure to the French heat shield, uh, you would need a fixture to hold them up. And you would need this fixture to be able to go through this test chamber door, which is at a facility in Germany. And all this was done with documents, right? You work all this out in advance and you document and you have stacks and stacks of documents. This was 1990. Um, I remember dealing with 20 page faxes from Aerospatiale with modifications to these interface documents. Um, Microsoft had not yet established world hegemony over word processing. We, the official project tool was called uh, DisplayWrite 4, which I think is extinct. There were no PDFs. There was um, no World Wide Web. Um, space scientists were among the few people that had email at the time. Um, but this was all done um, much harder than it perhaps is, uh, is done now. But this is why this is complicated um, and ultimately why it's expensive. Um, here's um, Saturn's orbit around the sun, um, just to set the context for, for seasons. Um, Saturn goes around the sun once every 29 and a half Earth years. Uh, and that sort of sets the pace of, of exploration as we'll um, uh, discuss. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Titan and Saturn have seasons. Um, 2003 was, uh, 2002 was mid-southern summer. Um, the Voyager encounter was in um, northern spring, and we're just moving into northern summer right now with Cassini, having gone around once uh, since Voyager. Um, there's a little wrinkle, which is that the orbit around the sun is slightly eccentric. Um, uh, Titan is 10% uh, closer during southern summer than during northern summer, and that turns out to be uh, quite important. Um, the, this time scale of, of 30 years is sort of, sort of interesting. Um, you know, you basically a human being gets to go around the block two and a half times. You can sort of map yourself out. You know, I was born close to southern midsummer, went to uh, a grammar school and university, and then worked for the European Space Agency, uh, moved to the US, met somebody nice, got married. Um, we built um, uh, Huygens and Cassini over this period, 1990. It was put on the launch pad in 97. It took seven years to get to, uh, to Titan. The Huygens probe was delivered about uh, six months later. This is the Huygens encounter. We'll come back to that. Um, and then uh, Cassini was supposed to work for four years, um, but it's been husbanded very carefully. The fuel is being managed carefully. We have this nuclear power, which keeps us going. Um, so the mission was extended a couple of years, and then... Um, uh, we boldly uh, uh, 
uh, asserted that it would be wonderful to aim to um, get a full seasonal cycle and uh, last through the summer solstice. And the plans have been developed to do that, actually with a, with a quite spectacular end game that will study Saturn very closely. Um, but really a lot of the action seasonally is going to be happening in these, uh, these next few years, as I'll show. Um, and the future missions to Titan I'll be talking about were sort of uh, aimed at this, uh, this quadrant here. So, um, as I said, Cassini was launched in um, 97. Um, Titan has been changing since that happened. Um, in particular, um, we observed during uh, southern midsummer in the early parts of the, the last decade um, that clouds started appearing. Was, these were able to be detected with the um, large uh, ground-based telescopes equipped with adaptive optic systems, as I mentioned. You know, from the ground, Titan is kind of too small to really see, but with a, a big telescope with a, an adaptive optic system that compensates for the atmospheric shimmering, you can take quite good pictures. I mean, these are about 50 pixels across from the Keck. Um, and they showed um, clouds coming and going around the South Pole where the sunlight was strongest at this season. So we knew even before Cassini arrived that there was um, meteorological activity ongoing um, today. A lot of that cloud activity sort of fizzled out when Cassini arrived as if Titan was shy or something, um, but we're expecting it to come back very soon. Um, higher in the atmosphere, there's a, an interesting phenomenon that was uh, known about from Voyager. You might, if you were sharp-eyed, um, notice that uh, in the northern polar regions in the Voyager picture, there was kind of a dark circle. Um, that dark circle uh, reappeared in the south in 2002, as observed by, by these Hubble images. Um, in fact, what's happening is all this organic muck in the atmosphere, the haze, is moving um, back and forward over uh, half a Titan year. Um, but there's something special happening at the pole. Um, this area is in continuous shadow during the winter. Um, and that means that uh, compounds that would be destroyed by ultraviolet light can build up um, and that the air is getting colder. So stuff that would normally be a gas can condense and form this, uh, this dark haze. And it doesn't diffuse out because there's a, uh, a jet stream around the pole, much as there is a circumpolar vortex around um, the polar regions in winter on Earth. And on Earth, you get downwelling air from the stratosphere that's um, depleted in ozone because uh, uh, special clouds form polar stratospheric clouds that act as catalytic surfaces to destroy ozone. And that ozone hole is, is buttoned up by these winds. So you know, the, the chemistry is very different, and the timescales at which things are happening is different. But the physics is very, very much the same. Now, whether we can learn more in a comparative planetology sense by... Uh, using Titan as an analog for the Earth, or vice versa, I don't know. But for sure, there are things to be uh, learned by, by making these comparisons. Um, in fact, um, we, we continue to be surprised. Um, the uh, northern polar uh, vortex has been breaking up um, in the last couple of years, and stuff is starting to form over the south as we move into southern winter. And uh, just, um, just over a year ago, this, this weird sort of... Uh, infinity-shaped or a, a figure of eight-shaped cloud system was um, detected by Cassini over the South Pole, and really nobody expected that. There's a very analogous uh, feature seen in the Venus atmosphere as well, um, and there's a, a lot of dynamics and condensation going on that you know, may help us understand some of these processes more generally. Um, one of the other uh, surprises of Cassini was one of the first surprises um, was we expected um, photochemistry in the upper atmosphere, um, and even though Cassini flies, through, flies past Titan at an altitude of 1,000 kilometers, um, it's in orbit around Saturn, but it flies by Titan once every month or so. Um, 1,000 kilometers is, is about as low as we, we want to go. Um, it gives us a nice kick so we can modify the orbit around Saturn by using the, the slingshot effect. Um, but even at 1,000 kilometers, there's um, lots, of, lots of gas up there. Um, were we to, um, this is a, a mass spectrum, so you know, bigger molecules are up here, smaller ones down there. Um, were we to do this measurement at Earth, there'd be three or four lines sticking out. You know, oxygen, nitrogen, nitrous oxide, hydrogen, um, that would be about the end of the story. But there's all this stuff, even to quite large masses, benzene, for example, uh, mass 72. Um, and actually, there's other indications of um, phenanthrene, stuff up to molecular weights of, of, of several thousand. Uh, the chemistry up here turns out to be much more complicated 
than was expected. Part of it's because it's some of it's iron chemistry rather than neutral, but there's a real organic chemistry factory um, uh, at work in the uh, upper atmosphere, even at these altitudes. And that stuff all drizzles down to the surface. Uh, a few years ago, I was involved in an exercise to think, well, you know, if you had a, an open checkbook, what would you want to do? You know, you'd want to send an orbiter and, and balloons and a lander and all that. So the, some of the rationale for that here was that we know from the laboratory experiments and these Cassini measurements what happens when methane and nitrogen get broken down in planetary atmospheres. And they form all this stuff. And when you do it in the lab, you get basically this brown slime on the inside of your glassware, uh, which is very difficult to clean up. But when you try and clean it up with water, what happens is it forms uh, amino acids um, and uh, bases like pyrimidines. These are the chemicals that encode information in, in DNA. Um, so, you know, jumping from, it's not a big step to add water. Titan is too cold for liquid water to persist on the surface. The surface temperature is 94 Kelvin. Um, but you'd say the same thing about molten rock on the Earth. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just means it's, it's somewhat exceptional. Um, so there uh, are likely places on Titan's surface where um, this organic muck that's been drizzling down onto the surface has been exposed to liquid water. We think there's water in Titan's interior and this, the crust, if you like, is mostly, mostly water ice. Um, where this stuff has been uh, exposed to make um, these prebiotic compounds. And then we don't know what happens or even what could happen. Um, these are just experiments that are not readily done on uh, grant timescales, let's say. Um, you know, there's the, the sort of then a miracle occurs bit. Um, we um, wish we don't know much about, but we know the building blocks are there uh, on Titan. And so there's, uh, um, you know, the question of could life evolve on Titan? Well, maybe we don't know really enough about how life evolved on the Earth. Um, there's liquid water in Titan's interior as there is on uh, other moons of the solar system, but there's a lot more organics on Titan, and that's why maybe there's a lot more uh, low-hanging fruit in, in terms of what we can learn uh, from future missions. Anyway, um, all that thinking was also behind the Huygens probe, which was um, really descending into the unknown. We had no idea uh, whether we we're going to land in a global ocean of liquid hydrocarbons or slam onto a, a solid sheet of ice or land in some foo-foo dust that would just you know, bury the probe. We, so in fact, post-impact survival was not a design requirement on the, the probe. And I, I had the good fortune to work um, at an early stage in the probe's design uh, uh, for ESA. Um, I then went to the UK to um, do my PhD, uh, during which I had the, the unprecedented opportunity to um, design and build uh, one little bit of the probe. Um, so the probe is about 1.3 meters across, a um, couple of hundred kilograms. And it, uh, even though it wasn't necessarily designed to survive contact with the surface, we did hedge our bets and include some instrumentation to measure surface properties should the probe survive. Uh, some of that stuff was designed to uh, function in a liquid. Um, I actually spent a lot of time uh, figuring out um, splashdown loads uh, of a vehicle landing in liquid hydrocarbons, and dug out all the old Apollo papers. Um, but to hedge my bets, I, I also worked on this thing called a penetrometer. It's basically a little metal thing um, about the, literally the size of my finger. It sticks out of the bottom of the probe, and when the probe lands at five meters a second, uh, which is what um, that water glass would land on the floor if I knocked it off at, uh, very convenient for testing. Um, when the thing lands at five meters a second, um, this thing gets rammed into the ground and develops a, a little signal. Um, there's a disc of a piezoelectric ceramic in here, a lot like a, um, a barbecue lighter. You know, when you squeeze it, it makes a spark. Um, so when you squeeze this, it generates a charge. Um, and when you push it into the ground, as I did during my, my thesis, um, you get uh, a force profile. So sa dry sand you know, has grains that sort of lock up when you squeeze it. So you get this uh, sort of exponentially growing force profile here. Uh, wet clay has a more or less constant resistance, so it looks like this. And gravel is kind of spiky with the height of the spikes and the spacing of the spikes, uh, depending on how big the grains are. Um, well, anyway, I built the instrument, put it in a cupboard, and it was put in a box and put on the probe. The probe was put on Cassini. Cassini was put on the rocket, and the rocket went away from uh, Florida in October 1997, uh, went around Venus uh, twice, once past the Earth, uh, past Jupiter in 2000, um, and got to uh, Saturn in 2004. Um, Christmas Eve, the probe was released from Cassini. Uh, it coasted for 21 days with just three clocks running, everything very quiet and cold. Hit the top of the atmosphere at six kilometers a second, 
the French ballistic missile heat shield tiles protected it. Uh, the parachute came out. We had a two and a half hour um, descent. Actually, not quite two and a half hours. It was 8869.75 seconds, and that number is important. Um, the number is important because um, there was a, a bottle of um, Scottish medicine um, riding on the, the exact duration um, between, between the instant that the uh, pyrotechnic charge to fire the parachute out of the back was deployed to the moment that this device sensed the contact with the surface. And actually, my PhD advisor uh, won, won the bet, um, but was kind enough to share. Um, there was, incidentally, a, a, a siege mentality at the uh, European Space Operations Center in Darmstadt when the probe encounter was, was happening. Um, uh, there were maybe 80 scientists who'd been involved in Cassini and Huygens since you know, the early 90s, so we'd been working for a decade and a half on this. And there were something like 200 journalists. So we were kind of buttoned away. We'd been working on this all these years. Um, you'd think we'd get um, time to you know, carefully evaluate the data and understand what we saw, but no. We got the data about 6 p.m. This was a Friday evening, and the press conference was 11, uh, and they wanted answers. So I, to my, much to my surprise, in fact, after uh, you know, designing and building this thing for three years and having it in space for seven, you know, it, it seemed to have worked for the one twentieth of a second it was supposed to work. Um, but the data looked nothing like anything I'd calibrated it with. Um, but when we took a, a little bit of a step back, we sort of thought, oh, it's kind of flat. And 50 newtons, you know, that's the basically uh, weight of 10 pounds, um, is uh, what you'd get maybe ramming it into wet snow or something like that. And then we thought, well, OK, this, this bump is just the back end hitting. We don't need to think about that. But what's this spike? You know, did, was there a spark that jumped between the ground and the sensor? Um, did we hit a rock? Or was there like a hard layer on top of a softer layer? And we thought, yeah, I like that. We thought creme brulee um, is my, my favorite desserts. We, we then had to spend um, five minutes Googling um, you know, how to get the accents right, because there's gonna be <laughs> fr fr our fr French colleagues would, would not forgive us if we um, you know, we hadn't looked at the pictures at this time. We didn't know what we'd landed in. We were going just on the squiggly line here. Um, anyway, my, my boss um, used that uh, in, the, in the press conference, and the media loved that. Um, the headline in Nature magazine and then their news section that week was, Titan team gets just desserts with creme brulee surface. Um, so they, they lapped that up. Um, it turns out it probably wasn't um, a crust um, when we saw the pictures later that evening uh, from Huygens, and we had no right to get this picture. Right? The probe might not have survived, the probe uh, might have turned over, the parachute might have landed on top of the camera, you know, anything could have happened. But we got these, these pictures, there's something like 200 of exactly the same picture, except in one of them there's a little dewdrop appears. Um, but you have these rounded cobbles, which you get geologically by tumbling things in streams, uh, which confirm this you know, notion of the hydrological cycle. Um, and um, uh, we think that maybe the penetrometer struck one of these cobbles. Uh, we think the, the probe actually kind of made a dent in the ground and then kind of skidded out of it. Um, that, that reconstruction's only, only just been done. Um, the, the ground had uh, lots of organic junk in it. Uh, we know that much from, from one of the instruments, actually from, from Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, but uh, it was a, a great moment in, in planetary exploration and just uh, whetted our appetites. Um, Cassini has been continuing to study Titan uh, in the years since. It flies by, as I say, every few months. This picture this is a radar image about 200 kilometers across. Uh, it was a little bit further north than the Huygens landing site and shows all these um, braided river channels um, that are symptomatic of uh, flash floods, basically. The, the stream, stream flow varies enough that the flow can break out of the existing valleys and form new ones. Um, so that's characteristic of um, uh, uh, rare but heavy downpours. And that's kind of the paradigm we have for Titan's hydrological cycle. It's kind of like, a, um, you know, I, I like to say that Titan is to Earth's hydrological cycle what Venus is to its greenhouse effect. It's kind of a terrestrial trend, a situation taken to an extreme. Um, basically, the hydrological cycle works um, as if it was uh, an electrical circuit, charging up a capacitor. When the capacitor gets full, it discharges and starts again. So you evaporate moisture from the ground, it makes the atmosphere more and more uh, humid until you've got enough humidity that clouds can start forming. And when they do, the little cloud droplets coalesce and form raindrops and the humidity substantially empties out. Um, the Earth's atmosphere has a couple of centimeters worth of liquid in it as vapor, uh, so-called precipitable moisture. 
Um, and uh, evaporation and rainfall in one year is about one meter worth of liquid. So, you know, divide one quantity by the other and you get a couple of centimeters a week of rainfall. You do that calculation on Titan, um, you've got a big, big, thick atmosphere. It's cold and can hold a lot of moisture, um, several meters worth, in fact. But there's only enough sunlight to evaporate a few centimeters per Earth year. Um, so you do the division again and you end up with a few meters of rainfall um, but with centuries of drought in between. So rainfall on Titan could be quite spectacular. We've actually seen it happen. Um, we've seen clouds, we've seen the ground that was underneath the clouds get darker than it was before the cloud was there, and then the ground is progressively brightened. So the, the ground has got wet, and then the, the moisture is subsequently evaporated. Um, the Huygens probe took some pictures during its descent. Um, this is uh, a sort of bright highland terrain with some uh, river channels in it. Um, this is about seven kilometers across. The probe landed about there. Off in the distance, there are a couple of um, sand dunes, in fact. Uh, we didn't recognize them immediately. Um, it took an, another few months for them to be uh, made sense of. But in fact, Titan has more of its surface covered in sand dunes than any world in the solar system. Uh, only the fictional world, Arrakis, has much more uh, coverage. Um, these are, again, radar images, um, again, about 200 kilometers across. So these dunes are a couple of kilometers apart tens to hundreds of kilometers long. Um, by looking at the brightness uh, or, or in the radar image carefully, you can deduce that they're 150 meters or more high. Um, they deviate around topography in a way that shows us they're what are called linear dunes. Um, I've got a book on sand dunes coming out early next year, incidentally. Um, the best examples of which on Earth are not in the Americas, which may, may be why we didn't recognize them straight away, um, but in the Arabian deserts um, and in the Namib, um, and I was actually had the chance to visit the Namib um, uh, earlier this year. Um, so these are dunes on the Atlantic coast of southern Africa, um, and they are a couple of kilometers apart, hundreds of kilometers long, um, and 150 meters high. So we've got sand. Sand is probably this organic stuff drizzling from the atmosphere. Uh, the gravity is one seventh of Earth's. The air is four times denser than the Earth, and yet the dunes look the same and have the same size. Uh, which is telling us something interesting. Um, I think it turns out that the controlling factor is the uh, thickness of the atmospheric boundary layer. Um, but um, in fact, what the, the dunes are one of our key tools in understanding the winds on Titan um, that uh, uh, turn out to have interesting properties. Okay, so to the, the real topic of the, the, the lecture, we had this paradigm before Cassini arrived that we should find liquids on Titan. So it was disconcerting for the Huygens probe to land in a desert um, and for us to find sand dunes all over the equator. It was only when we started flying by the polar regions in 2006 that we got really compelling evidence of surface liquids. And again, it's a radar image um, that shows these black regions that are 20 or 30 kilometers across, uh, steep-sided depressions with a, a radar-absorbing material uh, in them. Uh, from other radar properties, we, we are pretty sure um, it's, uh, it's liquid, and that's been confirmed spectroscopically since then. Curiously, there are also a lot of lake-shaped holes in the ground that are the same depth as some of these that don't have liquid in them. So were these lakes in the past? Uh, have they etched into the ground by some sort of solution process? We're still trying to work that out, but um, it, this is already a clue that the climate story is not, not simple. Um, as uh, time has gone on, we've progressively mapped more and more of Titan's surface. Um, you're getting a sneak preview here, this uh, mosaic is going to be released uh, in a month and a half at the, uh, the AGU conference. Um, but to put matters in perspective, here's the North Pole. Here is uh, Ligia Mare. It's uh, uh, roughly 400 kilometers across. This kind of sprawling thing is called Kraken Mare. Um, and if you make the assumption, and we actually have data that supports the assumption, um, that uh, as on the Earth, lake and, and sea basins are roughly uh, one thousandth as deep as they are wide. I, if this is 300 kilometers across, it should be 300 meters deep in the middle. If you do that calculation, then you find there is between 100 and 1,000 times the uh, known inventories of oil and gas sitting here on Titan, waiting for us to pick up. Um, coincidentally, um, you know, this stuff is basically the same as liquefied natural gas. It's predominantly um, ethane and methane. Um, this is transported on the Earth um, basically at Titan temperatures, um, at 90 Kelvin or so, uh, slightly uh, more than one bar. So people work with this stuff, right? It's not weird and alien. People build pumps that have to work and have been demonstrated to work 
Um, people figure out how this stuff sloshes around in the tanks when the, the ship is in a storm. This is actually familiar engineering material. Um, and as you'll, you'll hear, splashdown is an easy way to uh, land on another world. Um, and so these seas, uh, even their scientific appeal aside, are actually one of the easiest places to go uh, to explore. Um, but um, from a geomorphological standpoint, there's also a lot to, to think about here. Um, not least, why there are these large seas um, in the northern hemisphere and there's hardly anything in the south. Um, there's one kind of sad little lake called Ontario Larkus. It's about the same size as Ontario, which is why it's called that. We had a look at that with uh, radar um, a few years ago and uh, know, in fact, that it's rather shallow, just a few meters deep. It has very, very uh, shallow um, margins. Um, maybe a gradient of one part in a thousand, a little bit less. A lot like um, the flatness of other pliers, uh, pliers we see on the Earth. This is racetrack plier in Death Valley National Park with the, the moving rocks. Um, and we actually observed a difference between uh, the outline of Ontario Larkus measured uh, with the Cassini's camera in 2005 and the radar outline we measured in 2009. It looks like it's receded. The shoreline has receded. The, the area of the lake has shrunk. Um, you don't need a lot of level drop to get that shrinkage because these gradients are so, sh so shallow. Um, it looks like maybe there's been a meter a year of, of loss of liquid. And that's consistent with what we'd expect from models of evaporation um, you know, based on what we observe with water vapor uh, on the Earth. Um, so we've got one, one sad, shallow, murky sea, apparently. Uh, there's data that suggests it's murky. Um, one shallow uh, lake in so Titan's southern hemisphere and all these big seas in the north. So you know, what's the difference? This is kind of a, 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 an analog to, to the Mars problem of the Martian polar caps are very distinct in area and composition. Um, you know, is it topography that's forcing this? Um, is it just an accident? Um, is it a seasonal thing? We know we can't, there's not enough energy put out by the sun to evaporate hundreds of meters of, water, uh, of liquid out of the seas and move it from one hemisphere to the other in, in a tight year. So it's got to be a longer term thing. And it turns out that probably the answer is maybe a little bit like Mars too, um, in that um, the, there are not a lot of non-linearities in the climate system. And so it becomes significant that even though the total amount of energy, you know, number of days times watts per square meter um, of sunlight delivered to the two hemispheres is the same, um, it's more intensely delivered in the South, uh, on Earth and Mars and Titan, coincidentally, um, in the present epoch. But that isn't always the case. Um, as the kroll milankovitch cycles uh, forcing the glacial cycles on Earth and forming the Martian polar layer terrain, um, that astronomical arrangement wherein the southern summer is shorter and more intense um, isn't a permanent feature. 30,000 years ago, the situation was the opposite on Titan. And so it could be that there were uh, more extensive seas in the south when there were you know, ice sheets marching down to New York and, uh, and across my birthplace. Um, so, you know, Titan again is showing itself to have these very terrestrial planet kind of behaviors and phenomena under very different settings, um, but uh, ri rich in, in, uh, in process and, and effect. Um, on shorter timescales, um, one thing we, um, we see uh, with the outline of Ligia Mare is, is these sort of crenellated islands. Um, you get this by having um, mountains with river valleys cut in them that have then been flooded by rising liquid levels. You know, we think there's been some sort of tectonic depression here or maybe the, just there's more liquid in the, in the sea um, as part of this, uh, this climate cycle. Um, you see that uh, same morphology in places where liquid level is rising uh, or the land is sinking. This one is the uh, tip of Oman, where the um, Arabian plate is diving beneath the Eurasian plate, and so the land is sinking at a couple of centimeters per year. I don't know if we can translate that quantitatively to what's happening on Titan, but the morphology is certainly compelling. Um, you see the same kind of landscape in um, the western U.S. This is Lake Mead. Um, this is me on a TV shoot gesticulating outside the uh, open door of the helicopter um, that uh, the landscape's just like Titan because the lake level has risen uh, on Titan. It's not because we built a dam uh, as here. Um, uh, and for what it's worth, I think these dark stripes are um, something to do with the way the, the TV camera was being read out 
um, and the sunlight is being chopped by the rotor blades. I can't, cannot forget the sound engineer asking the pilot if there was something he could do about how fast the rotor blades were going. Um, <laughs> but there is, there is one other point to um, draw your attention to, which is this uh, white line here. Even though, you know, on a geologic kind of setting, large scale, the liquid level has risen, flooding all these valleys. In the last few years, uh, in the, the western US, um, climate conditions have allowed the lake level to drop, and all the minerals that precipitated out of the water have been left forming this, um, this uh, um, uh, what's the word, um, bathtub ring, um, as a signature of, of uh, decreasing levels. And we actually see the same thing on Titan. Uh, it was first noted around Ontario Larkus, consistent with the idea that Ontario has been shrinking, been drying out. Um, but there's, there's actually evidence of these different colored uh, surface deposits around a lot of the lakes in the north as well. So we're just starting to get a handle on what looks like a very complicated climate history. We know this change on, uh, on Titan on matters of hours as the, the clouds build up and come and go. We've actually seen the cloud tops rise at a few meters per second, just uh, as the models would, would expect. We've seen seasonal change. We suspect there is um, uh, change on astronomical timescales, tens of thousands of years. Um, and probably there is change on geological timescales. The sun has changed in luminosity. Probably the amount of methane in the system has changed. There may have been belches of volcanism that made Titan wetter than it is now, and maybe it dried up altogether. It seems like it's a overall a fairly dry place in that there's basically a lot less liquid in these, um, in these lakes than there is in the atmosphere. So there's, you know, it doesn't buy you out of that 10 million year problem. Um, but we're, as I say, we're still trying to get a handle on all that. Um, one, of the, um, uh, one of my colleagues on, on Cassini, uh, Ellen Stofan, has been uh, studying um, before she ascended to become NASA chief scientist and couldn't actually do science anymore. Um, studied uh, the area around Ontario and noted what looks like the outline of a, a rather larger basin that has a lot of kind of river valleys at its margins. This is somewhat circumstantial indication that perhaps there was uh, a larger sea there. So as I say, we, we're just starting to, to look at Titan in these terms. This is in a way a lot like how Mars was um, after Viking. You know, all these new questions have come up and uh, forcing new avenues of research, but in a very nicely comparative uh, kind of way. Um, so there are lakes and seas. Uh, are there tides? Um, the answer is yes. Um, they're a little bit different than Earth's because whereas the Earth sort of rotates underneath the tidal bulge pulled by the moon and the sun, um, Saturn um, you know, is always in the same point on Titan's sky. And so the bulge is always in the same point on Titan's sky. But because Titan's orbit around uh, Saturn is slightly elliptical, that bulge grows and shrinks if it were a global ocean. It's not a global ocean, but if you work out what happens into the basins, um, you see there should be, in Kraken Mare at least, a tidal amplitude of perhaps uh, uh, several meters. Um, in Ontario, it's rather, rather smaller. Um, the basins aren't, um, aren't big and shallow enough for um, there to be resonant tides, as you get, say, in the Bay of Fundy or the North Sea uh, on Earth. Um, so in that sense, they're a little bit simpler, um, but fun to, fun to think about and probably play a big role in mixing um, the, uh, the liquid. So it may destroy seasonal stratification that might, might otherwise occur. Um, the currents depend on how deep the, the seas are. Um, best guess is maybe a couple of um, centimeters a second, fairly, fairly low. Now one puzzle is um, studying these seas, we see lots of evidence for them being dead flat. Um, the, the most picturesque thing is uh, to see the sun glint off the surface of the sea. Um, this uh, near-infrared picture shows that happening at, at Titan's North Pole. There's some radar voodoo that we can do um, that actually uh, showed us that the surface roughness on Ontario Larkus was um, three millimeters or less. Um, and this is sort of a puzzle because you've got this low gravity and in principle rather water-like or even more mobile liquid. Um, and a dense atmosphere, it should be easy to make waves. Um, if you um, do the slightly unorthodox experiment of pouring out a pan of water and putting it in a wind tunnel at NASA Ames Research Center um, and making some, some little waves and then pour the water away and put in some kerosene when nobody's looking, um, as a sort of Titan analog, you find that, sure enough, you get waves at lower wind speeds, um, waves that are easier to form. 
Um, so the question is, you know, why don't we see waves on Titan? I mean, these things are more than three millimeters. Um, so one possibility is um, that the seas are murky, and that may be the case with Ontario. Uh, we're getting evidence that maybe it's not the case for the big seas in the north, um, which is maybe what you'd expect if Ontario is drying out and all the goop is being left behind, and the northern seas are basically the pure distilled methane and ethane, so they're nice and clean. Um, so that, that's still a, still a puzzle. But um, we know all this other stuff is produced in the upper atmosphere, and it's going to drizzle down. Some of it's going to dissolve. Maybe all this makes the, the liquid more viscous. Um, this is a cute uh, installation art uh, in London where uh, some actually used sump oil uh, has been used to make a very nice mirror. I mean, this, this is basically the radar mirror we've observed with, uh, with Cassini so far. Um, so, you know, why haven't the waves appeared? Is it because this, the uh, liquid is viscous? Maybe not. Um, best guess right now is that we've just been looking in the calm season. Now, you can have windy days on a calm season and calm days on a windy season. That, that's always going to be a challenge with small numbers of observations. But um, the strength of the winds is determined substantially by how much uh, sunlight there is uh, falling onto the surface. And so as we move into northern summer, uh, we're about here, um, we're expecting in the models that the, uh, the winds and, and models um, diverge on exactly when this happens and by how much it happens, but they all have the same pattern. You know, su summer is the windy season. Um, and the models predict that we should be coming up to the levels where waves should start to appear um, basically any day now. Um, Cassini, as I said, is planned to operate through 2017. So um, stay tuned. This will be big news when, um, if and when it gets detected. Um, unfortunately, Ontario, we just caught just too late. Um, uh, and maybe, actually, Ontario's wave threshold was at the upper end because of the, the viscous liquids. Anyway, I should, should press on. So, um, Cassini, as I mentioned, is planned to uh, operate um, through 2017. At least the mission plan is. The NASA budget is a different story. Um, but we have a lot of Titan encounters planned and encounters with Enceladus as well and other wonders in the, the Saturnian system. Uh, there's a lot to look forward to. But, of course, um, because it takes seven years to get out to Saturn, um, it takes something like five or six years to develop a mission. It's already time to be thinking about um, possible follow-on ideas. Um, and that's uh, this notion of sailing on Titan. Um, this was a, an idea uh, originated um, by Ellen Stofan with uh, myself and Jonathan Lenin, um, working with an APL team um, and Lockheed Martin, and uh, was stimulated by a NASA um, idea of uh, what could you do if you had a radioisotope generator that was more efficient than the radio, um, the thermoelectric units that are used right now. Um, and uh, we uh, did the study for NASA and, um, uh, in fact, proposed the uh, concept to uh, a competed mission opportunity NASA has. They say to the community, come up with some ideas, um, and uh, if we like them, we'll pick a few of them to study further. So there were 28 uh, mission concepts submitted to NASA. And these are all, you know, kind of multiple person month things to put together. Um, but uh, uh, there were three selected out of the 28, and time was one of them. And we uh, then followed with a, a detailed one year study um, where we really poked at all the details of how we would do this. And that's where the, uh, the sort of latest of my, my adventures come in. Um, one of the key things is you don't need to worry if you're going to um, splash down into a a sea about you know gullies and rocks and you know how springy the landing gear needs to be. Um, you just splash down. Um, it, 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 it was done by Apollo and Mercury and Gemini before it for the very simple reason: it's the easiest way to do this. Um, it takes a lot of unknowns out of the equation. Um, it's uh, spectacular. We don't need to worry about recovering the thing afterwards. It just needs to splash down and, and, and work. Um, so I got to have fun. Uh, literally getting my hands dirty at a, uh, a lab in at Penn State where we had a big pool and high-speed video and accelerometers and stuff and work out what the splashdown loads would be, what the uh, safe uh, range of impact conditions would be. Um, it didn't really surprise us, but it's always nice to, um, to uh, prove what you, what you think you know already. Um, we uh, had to think about what would we um, measure that would be useful. Uh, this whole set of scientific objectives obviously measure the composition of the liquid. That's, that's sort of a given. Uh, see what gunk is dissolved in there. 
Um, but there's a whole set of interesting disciplines to uh, engage here um, in air-sea interaction. You know, it's uh, the warmth in the upper layers of the ocean that drive hurricanes. Um, it's uh, it's uh, waves that assail our coastlines. And the exchange of matter and heat and momentum across the air-sea interface is something that we really only understand empirically at the Earth. By going to a different environment where the gravity is different and the atmosphere is different and measuring what's going on, if we can build an understanding, build models that work on Earth and Titan, then you can be more con confident that those models are right and that they'll wor still work when you push the boundary conditions, when you go to warmer temperatures or whatever. So uh, we wanted to measure the weather above the, uh, uh, above the waterline, um, you know, the wind speed, the methane humidity, the temperatures, the pressures. Uh, we'd have a camera, take pretty pictures, maybe see clouds puffing up in the, in the distance, maybe see a shoreline. Um, measure the composition of the liquid, uh, measure whether there's uh, stuff suspended in it, you know, is it murky or not? That affects how deep the solar heating is deposited. Uh, we'd want to measure how deep it is, we'd use a sonar. Um, that was a lot of fun. Um, APL uh, is a lab that um, was originated to, to do work for the Navy. So even though uh, you know, I'm in the civilian space business that uh, works mostly with NASA, you know, there are people at APL who figure out sonars. And so we tested sonar transducers in liquid nitrogen and find they work just fine. Actually, if you look at the details of how this is put together, it's a lot like a penetrometer. It's a piezoelectric disc sandwiched between some, some metal lumps. But we did the testing, the sonar would work great. Um, we uh, had to figure out you know, how big are the waves going to be, are there going to be waves. Um, you don't want to trust one global circulation model. Uh, it's become a bit of a cottage industry for Titan. I mean, even if you look on the weather channel to see where the next hurricane's going to go, you know, they show two different models um, with two different predictions for the, for the Earth, where we have you know, dozens of satellites going around, hundreds of weather balloons launched every day, thousands of meteorological stations, um, and we still don't know exactly what the weather's going to be tomorrow. So guessing what the weather is going to be on July the 2nd, 2023 is, is sort of an inexact science, but you can at least see where the different models uh, agree and uh, on that basis develop some confidence that you uh, uh, can design a system to uh, tolerate those conditions. Um, if there are waves, then you need to figure out how is the vehicle going to respond. The liquid's different, the gravity's different. You can plug all that into a computer model. These models exist for the offshore en uh, engineering industry. Um, they're readily adapted. You know, we figured out the random wave spectrum, how the vehicle would bob around, how fast we need to gimbal our antenna to point back at the Earth. Um, all this stuff is not your usual spacecraft engineering, um, especially not big, heavy sonar transducers. In, in space, no one can hear you scream. Um, but we um, uh, addressed all these problems and figured out um, you know, plans, uh, detailed plans of how to, how to do this. Um, we would, um, and this was one of the most interesting and fun things of the study for me, was you know, we knew we could deliver the vehicle with its parachute descent uh, somewhere safely in the middle of the sea. We'd be guaranteed some time at sea. We wouldn't know exactly where we were going to go. We're not driving. We're just drifting in the wind. Uh, we did at one time think about having little thrusters uh, to push us around, but then you've got to worry about testing them and pay for them and all that. So we decided to just, uh, just sail. So if you um, try and figure out how fast a windblown object, floating object will go, Turns out the first calculation on that uh, was the same guy who did the first uh, map of the trade winds on the Earth, um, the astronomer Edmund Halley. Um, actually, the same year as he did his trade winds map and the same year he did it, the prediction of the transit of Venus. Um, actually, the best modern literature is in the uh, iceberg drift literature, but this is also of concern for drifting cargo uh, containers and stuff like that. So anyway, you can develop a, an estimate of how fast the thing is going to drift given a a wind speed, and you start with a thousand hypothetical Titan Mari explorers and see where they go after, after one Titan day and after three Titan days and uh, after six. And you find after six, and this was sort of our nominal mission duration, probably about half of them make it to the shore. Um, interestingly, a different uh, model predicted that they would actually drift the other way, but at roughly the same speed, so we'd be guaranteed some days at sea. Um, so this is all really fun stuff. I mean, the outreach potential here would be great. You know, you could imagine kids in every school in the country pinning maps on where time is today um, you know, based on the uh, determinations we've made during the mission. Um, we would um, incidentally be able to see mountains on the horizon. We have some stereo uh, radar maps from Cassini that give us the, the height of some of these mountains. So we'd be able to see peaks on the horizon from, from, from quite far off at sea. 
Um, that would be fun to figure out too. Anyway, as you may know, if you follow these things closely, uh, this was a competed mission. There were three uh, other missions in con uh, contention, sorry, two other missions in contention, and uh, NASA elected to pursue the, uh, um, the arguably safer one, uh, Mars mission, um, carrying a, a seismometer, worse, a French seismometer, uh, to Mars. Um, so we are, are looking at the possibilities for uh, reproposing this, and there is, I guess, some debate about uh, how um, NASA might be directed to, to do something like this. Um, so we'll see. Um, one uh, saving grace, um, because this mission relies on the geometric opportunity of being able to send the data directly back to Earth. You, know, you don't need a relay spacecraft because you can see the Earth from uh, the, the northern polar regions during northern summer in 2023. Now, the Earth um, moves further south as time goes on, as we move into towards um, southern summer again in the late 2020s, uh, 2030 time frame. But this new Cassini radar image from uh, the, the, the last couple of months shows us that there are a couple of large basins in Kraken Mare that are big enough to splash down in safely. So th those buy us another year or two. So there's still a chance to, uh, to pull this off if the agency is so motivated and empowered. Um, so to um, sort of sum up, um, I think the seas are, are really fun places to explore from all kinds of scientific perspectives. Um, that's true of Titan generally, but um, the seas in particular. Um, the northern polar regions are coming into summer. We're expecting the winds to pick up. We're expecting maybe the cloud activity to pick up. Maybe there'll be waves. Um, so stand by for a lot of new exciting uh, discoveries from Cassini. And um, you know, there are a lot of things that, that are interesting to do at Titan. You could easily fly a hot air balloon. You could fly an airplane. There's a lot to be learned from orbit, as have, there have been many orbiters to, to Mars in the past. Um, there's a lot to do. Um, but let me just close, since I happen to go to the, the same grammar school as William Shakespeare, uh, with this uh, Shakespeare quote that um, we could still sail on Titan if we uh, uh, take the chance. Um, otherwise, we will need to wait another 30 years. So thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Please, yes. Uh, there's a microphone going around. Please uh, stand up. Uh, say your name and whether you're a member of the society or not. Uh, uh, Keith Lynch, not a member. I only come to these like once or twice a year. Uh, why not put a rudder and a uh, sail on it so you can keep it uh, going around, uh, move it at will for years? There's, um, there's an axiom in spacecraft engineering that you can always add stuff. Um, doing so never makes it cheaper. Um, the uh, discovery framework that we uh, proposed this mission to uh, is a cost-constrained mission. Basically, you can get $425 million and not a penny more. And it was a tight squeeze to get below that cap, uh, even with as simple and straightforward a vehicle as this. Um, that's not to say we wouldn't look at it, um, but um, we, can, we laid out and sold the mission on the basis of certain scientific measurements and objectives. The sad fact is engineers and managers look at that and they say, do you need this bell and whistle to achieve these objectives? If the answer is no, then you don't pay for it. Um, so um, one could do that. Um, there have been proposals for um, little boats with, with screws that could kind of climb out of the sea onto the land. Um, you can imagine all these things, and, you can, and they would probably work. Um, but the space business, unfortunately, is about things working with 99.5% um, reliability and demonstrable 99.5% reliability. I mean, the way, the way NASA and uh, the space business works today, you wouldn't do Apollo. It'd be too risky, um, which is sort of sad. Um, so... Um, Great idea. It would, it would likely work. It would likely open up some interesting possibilities in where you go. Uh, we didn't propose that because we had to fit under the cap. Um, if the cap is bigger, you can imagine adding kind of bells and whistles. My name is Rudy Krutar. I am a member of the Society. I grew up in Montana, and in western Montana, there was 7,500 years ago, there was a large lake called Lake Missoula. You can, 
an ice dam in the northern part of the lake burst, yep. and it took six weeks for a, over a 200-foot weir for the lake to empty. You can still see the bathtub rings high in the mountains mm. in the area, like 200 feet above the level of the, of the rivers. My question here is, is there anything comparable on Titan? Can you see any high bath, bathtub rings, or is there any possibility of there being some kind of ice dam on any of these lakes? Um, and I know you not liquid, but not, not water, but uh, ice, but uh, any kind of ice. Yeah, um, so uh, I guess I'm a member of the society too. Um, I've, not, never, now I've never grown up, and I don't plan to, um, although I did spend my early years in, in Scotland where you also see um, lots of evidence of, of, um, of glacial activity. I've been to um, the channeled scablands that, that have the evidence of the, the, um, the, the catastrophic drainage of, of Lake Missoula. Um, you know, the, the scars of climate change are, are, are with us. Um, so there are features on Titan, I don't have any in, in this presentation, that um, perhaps bear witness to more energetic flow of liquid than we can presently explain with the climate today. Um, but with regard to uh, possible um, uh, fossil lakes or seabeds, um, this is probably the best guess morphologically in that it, it, there are these sort of um, river channels that suddenly stop, which is what you'd expect if a river drained into a former sea. Um, what is interesting is we have a, a, a global topography map, or substantially complete topography map of Titan. And uh, Ontario Larkus, which is the last biggest uh, liquid deposit in the southern hemisphere, is not in the lowest part of the southern hemisphere, um, which you know, may say something about how poorly uh, hydraulically connected the lakes are. Um, in, in the northern hemisphere, they all seem to be at the same level. So there's, there's groundwater connecting them, if you like, or ground, ground methane. We, we decided we'd just stick with water and hydrology. You know, if you can have mag magnetohydrodynamics, you can have hydrology on Titan. It's not quibble about the nomenclature. But um, the uh, presence of liquid here at higher elevations than adjacent basins that are dry um, does seem to say there's something um, limiting the hydraulic connection between the basins. Um, but you know, our, our mapping coverage with data of this quality is um, still only 40 or 50 percent complete. Um, so there's probably a lot of other lake basins lurking that we haven't seen yet. But there's certainly some indication of liquid where there ha isn't liquid now and possibly even liquid flow um, more energetic than we, we can account for today. Quick questions. Um, mm. How does the viscosity of liquid methane compare with, to that of water? Um, great question. Um, so the uh, viscosity of pure liquid methane, um, like, like that of water, is, is temperature dependent, but at the temperature we think is pertinent, um, it's actually about uh, six times less, uh, six times less viscous than um, than water. Liquid ethane um, is about the same as water. Um, and if you, uh, at the same as water at room temperature, um, if you add uh, some of the propane and other gunk, um, it, you might double that, um, at least some of the models suggest, um, which is about the same effect as cool, cooling water down to four Celsius. You know, water actually feels more viscous swimming through it you know, when you have lower temperatures. Um, so to a first order, it's not that different. It's, it, you know, the stuff is going to behave a lot like gasoline, frankly. Um, in terms of its um, flow characteristics. Second question, any problem building cryogenic instruments that would function for a period of time? Well, there's, um, so any instrument that, that works to measure Titan's environment by definition is either a remote instrument or one that is functioning at cryogenic temperatures. So the sonar to work has to be physically in intimate contact with the liquid. And so, for example, we um, tested that sonar transducer to work at cryogenic temperatures. Um, other instrumentation, uh, for example, the gas chromatic, uh, sorry, the mass spectrometer to analyze the liquid um, would draw a sample of liquid inside the warm uh, inside of the probe. And the, the probe is heated by this radioisotope generator. Um, you know, the, the thing puts out 100 watts of electricity, 
but 500 watts of heat. And at Titan, you, you need that waste heat um, to, to, to stay warm. So you, you, to measure something in situ, you have to have the sensing element function at cryogenic temperatures. But uh, all the electronics, you, you can make function at room temperature just by putting it in a, an insulated box. Hi, I'm Larry Milstein. I'm a member of the Society. Me too. Um, so Jupiter's a complex system like Saturn with lots of moons and interesting targets to explore, and one of them is Europa. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you'd comment a little bit on, in contrast, the uh, advantages and disadvantages and potential interest of going to Europa as opposed to Titan. Well, there's... Um This is, this is my, my own opinion, um, that um, Titan is a much more interesting object. There is more going on. Um, there is, at present... I should say, I think we should go to both, but... <laughs> I, I, I would love to go to both. Europa is, Europa is an interesting object until you compare it to Titan. Um, uh, Europa has a liquid water layer, we're pretty sure, um, beneath 10 or 15 kilometers of ice. Um, there is at present no definitive evidence of two carbon atoms that have met on Europa. Um, it may be that Europa formed in the Proto-Jovian Nebula under conditions that did not accrete a lot of methane and, and carbon. Um, there'll be a bit of carbon drizzled in from comets and stuff. Uh, people talk about oxidants generated in the European ice by energetic particle bombardment. So you can sort of wave your hands and say, yeah, there's an energy source. So maybe there's... Maybe there's life down there. We don't know how life forms, let alone how it could be sustained. Um, but that's beneath 15 kilometers of ice. So um, you will learn about icy surfaces studying Europa. And in the very long term, maybe you can drill down and have stuff swim around. Titan um, also has liquid water interior, we're pretty sure. Um, but it's beneath 100 kilometers of ice. I would submit that the inaccessibility of an ocean beneath 100 kilometers of ice is just about as bad as, a, as 10. But there is a lot to study and learn about at a Titan surface because it has an atmosphere, because it has all this organics. So my own personal opinion is that the attention that Europa has largely by historical accident um, is, is misdirected. But I, but I would love us to be able to explore both. Other questions? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hi. Rebecca Prather, not a member. Uh, two questions. What powers Cassini? And how long is it expected to last from now? Right. The um, life limiting factor um, is essentially dollars. Um, so what is powering Cassini electrically uh, are these three radioisotope thermoelectric generators. So these carry a couple of tens of ki uh, kilograms of plutonium. Um, and the heat that just slowly leaks out of that stuff um, passes through a, a solid state converter. You know, basically the same thing that's in a, a CPU cooler uh, on, a, on a high performance processor chip, but, but in reverse. Um, so these put out about 700 watts um, at launch. I think we're down to 620 something now. I mean, the things do, do decay. Um, but the um, electrical power is not uh, a life limiting factor. Um, we use a little bit of fuel uh, to adjust Cassini's orbit when we fly by Titan and change its trajectory. We use um, some thrusters to, to do fast turns. Some, some slower turns, we don't need the thrusters, but um, some we do. Um, and the fuel for those thrusters is a finite resource. Um, we developed a plan that will let us do all these fun Titan flybys and Enceladus flybys through 2017, at which point we'll actually send Cassini into Saturn where it will burn up. And so the um, bureaucrats don't need to uh, worry about who can get hold of the plutonium at that point. Um, it, it's actually a serious consideration for planetary protection. Um, if you were to dump this stuff that's warm on Enceladus, could it melt through and all that? Um, so, um, the, um, basically, we, we've tuned the, the tour to use up the last drops of fuel. 
um, if something were to go wrong, right, if we lost contact with Cassini because the computer failed or something, and you know, a thruster stuck on, um, maybe it would use up all the fuel and we'd need to, or half the fuel, and we'd need to change those plans. But with the plan we have for operating the spacecraft, we can uh, operate through 2017. Um, you, know, you can't say with a you know, spacecraft that was designed to work um, until 2008, you know, everything is past its warranty. So something could break. You know, we hope it won't happen. The track record has been very good. So the expectation is that we can run until we decide to stop in 2017. Um, the latest NASA budget plan, I think, only has us going to 2015, so somebody has to find the money to operate this somewhere. But that's, that's a different problem. That's not a technical problem. Thank you. I'm Dave Rubinowitz. I am a member. Uh, the slide you were showing of the old uh, bathtub ring mm. that you estimate maybe 30,000 years ago, is there a reason to believe it was... It, it was not maybe 15 years ago, half an orbit, when this... That's a, that's a great question. Um, so the reason to, to doubt that would be that this is something like 50 kilometers. So even with the most shallow, geologically reasonable terrain, this would require uh, a substantial evaporation. Um, that's not to say it couldn't happen. It, it seems unlikely. Nobody's, nobody's gone through the exercise of trying to disprove that hypothesis, but it's a, a great question to ask. Um, there are some uh, changes that we've seen. Um, as I mentioned, some areas have got dark and then dried out, as we've observed. Um, there are some areas in the south that we are pretty sure also changed. So it, it may well be that there are uh, albedo changes associated with shorter-term variations, but um, those haven't been um, as accurately documented. They're not as, as obvious. They're not as, uh, as compelling a story as, as this large-scale stuff seems to be for, for a longer term. One more question. Uh, I was wondering, is the methane of primordial origin, or do you know what... So the... ...between uh, carbon-12 and carbon-13, so I was wondering... Ah, great, yeah. Um, so the isotopic ratios that uh, Cassini has been able to measure and, and Huygens has been able to measure, some you can actually measure from the ground with um, uh, millimeter wave astronomy from ALMA and, and, and others, um, show that the um, nitrogen has been heavily fractionated um, in, in 14 to 15 ratio, but the um, carbon isotope ratio in methane has not. You can measure the carbon isotope ratio in actually several different compounds. So the thinking is that Titan had a thicker atmosphere in the deep past, this is you know, billions of years ago, um, and lost a lot of it. And, and that explains the nitrogen fractionation. Whereas the methane that we see today is in a way primordial uh, in that it's been either locked up in Titan's interior or maybe delivered um, uh, since that fractionation event that affected the nitrogen. Um, so that's the best interpretation right now. Um, the, there's uh, uh, various attempts to guess how old is Titan's surface and atmosphere by you know, counting the craters and other estimates and some of these isotopic evolution things. And they all seem to come out around 500 million years, which is not four and a half billion years. Right. So you know, there has been stuff going on in Titan's um, deeper history that we don't fully understand yet. Very good. Right. But thank you very much. In appreciation of your lecture, we have the announcement uh, framed and signed by all the members of the General Committee for you to keep. Thank you. Again, Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let me... Should I disconnect or... No, no, not yet. Oh, yeah, right.